Happy Friday and welcome to another edition of Husker Online Headlines. Sean Callahan, Steve Sipple. We kind of reshifted the week this week um, as we kind of put the recruiting calendar and cycle behind us here as Nebraska um, closes the book, Steve Sipple. And you look at the number of players uh, they added this hall. It really is a, a big number. I mean, technically... So technically, there's 27 true letter of intents, but then there are four walk-on type players that didn't sign letter of intents, but are three-star rated players. So really 31, then you have six transfers. So if you really want to get down to it, they've added 37 scholarship quality players here in this 2024 cycle. And 17 on hand for Spring ball, basically. 17 high school, counting uh, one of the walk-ons that okay. they added, and then six transfers, so 23 players. Have we And we've we've noted that, and we've expressed how unique that is. I It is shocking. Now, I guess that's maybe somewhat kind of new-age college football, but we covered many years at Nebraska where there might be three or four newcomers in spring ball, you know, that, it, that, that enroll early and roll in January. And now there's 23. Yeah. About 60%. I mean, 22 scholarship newcomers here of 37 kind of scholarship quality players. So about 60% of, you know, the three star to four star, five star players are here now, which you're, it's an incredible number. And, you know, you're already kind of starting to hear Matt rule discuss the impact a few of these guys have had, uh, particularly wide receiver Jamal Banks. Right. Jamal Banks is one of the guys that you will never worry about showing up for, for instance, an early passing workout. He's he's done very well in winter conditioning with the conditioning element, but also, Sean, they ask guys to do public service type things and other things that you would – they score. They have a point system. And Banks, according to Matt Rule – came in and is leading the point system by a long ways banks is all in he's driven yeah banks and this is a guy that had 60 plus catches in each of the last two years there he is right there he's a, he's a proven player at the power five level in the acc so that was really illuminating it was really illuminating. i know it got your attention when rule was talking about it yesterday yeah and i i think what's also interesting to me is it could be the fourth year in a row it, that a transfer portal wide receiver has led Nebraska in receiving um, Samore Torre, Trey Palmer, Billy Kemp, and now probably Jamal Banks, but Isaiah Nayor uh, could also be right up there as well from Texas. Yeah. So yep. um, they've had a rebound hard in the portal to kind of make up for some misses at the wide receiver position over the Scott Frost era. It They have, and it's going to look much different. That, that, that group that runs out there, is going to be a bigger bodied group. I mean, you have the you have the potential to run out Banks, six foot four, Naor six three. I suppose in some sets you could have Malachi Coleman out there at six two, right? Um, and then I mean, even Jaden Doss is sort of a he's not a real small slot like sometimes they've had in the past. And I'm talking about Billy Camp. I'm talking about Spielman. I'm talking about Juan Dale. These are li- those are little guys. I mean. And then we saw other little guys. Well, Jalen Lloyd. Jalen Lloyd's a pretty little guy. And I'm going, I mean, go back to the Frost era. There was a lot of little guys. I mean, just little receivers. Um, that, look at, I mean, look at number 80 there, Sean. That's not a little receiver. They're cha- that, the, the look of that room has changed. It needed to change. Because, yeah, in a Big Ten game, you're going to have a rare situation where a Trey Palmer or Jalen Lloyd can just run by you. That might only happen once or twice a game. You're going to have a lot more 50 50 balls, mm-hmm. kind of physical, you know, hand fighting situations yeah. Yeah, absolutely. where you better be well equipped. Mm-hmm. They, I like, but, but I want to say that I like that young group of guys they got. I think this is a good mix. You have guys like Jalen Lloyd, Malachi coming on, and, and Jaden Doss, and even something like Bryce Turner, maybe, or who else Sean there's some young guys that can really fly and it looked pretty good last year and now you add this veteran mix and I think it's very I can't think and, it could be very helpful yeah I don't think they were just ready to hand the keys over to that young group yet like that that that's why Naor and Banks were critical to give that younger group one more year of good seasoning before then oh, they yeah. take over 
yeah, 100 now. Oh, well, I got 100. Yeah, you got 100. And I'll tell you what, remember, it's the thing that I all, will always think back on with Naor and Banks is I always just figured they'd get one. They get either one of them. When they got both, it really opened my eyes. The other thing to watch going forward is, and we haven't talked a lot about this, but now you've made it pretty clear that you, who you think the starting quarterback would be, Dylan Raiola. Raiola, as you would say. Raiola. Raiola. Um, the thing about Dylan is, and I, he loves the tight end. So watch that position. It's got, I think it will grow in prominence if, if, if indeed Dylan is the quarterback. He likes going to tight ends. So those guys should be really, really excited. And I'm talking about Fedoni and Borkature. And then incoming, of course, Carter Nelson. When I asked Matt Rule this, too, about quarterbacks, they only have three scholarship quarterbacks. Yes. And look, it's not – the ideal number of Matt rule said it's pretty much the number he's always had everywhere he's gone. And last spring, and I don't know if this is for sure a record, but it has to be close to a record because you can't have much more than six scholarship quarterbacks. Well, Nebraska had six of them on spring ball. It's a lot. Now he made a great point yesterday to you in the spring. It makes a lot of sense just to have the three because they're all young guys. Now I get it. Um, Heinrich Harburg is a fourth year junior, but he's 20 years old. He, he's still developing. Then the other guys are true freshmen, Dylan and Danny Kalen. A lot of reps in the spring will be helpful. A lot of reps for those three young guys. And then he he told you, right, that 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 there's the possibility maybe in the summer to add another quarterback. And that that sort of strategy makes sense to me and the advancement of these quarterbacks too they, they're young in age but not like in how they know the position i mean daniel kalen and dylan riola are trained up yeah, Th are. this is they not are. kurt dukes early enrolling to nebraska mm -hmm. in 2002 i mean this no, is not no it's not um jamal lord coming you know where you're really a raw athlete just learning the position these guys know the position at a high level for their age and then hopefully now Glenn Thomas can get them better. Right. And you, the other part of it is the, the it's intangible. You've talked to Daniel Kalen a lot. He's very mature. I've talked to him. He, you know, it's not like you're talking to a kid. Dylan's sure not like that. I mean, Dylan's like a 25 year old. He's in it's, I mean, he's, He's just advanced. He's advanced in a lot of ways. And so is Danny Kalen. I, I mean, we sometimes we we get so caught up in the D Dylan Riola conversation, but Daniel Kalen is a mature individual and he'll attack he'll attack his work like he attacked the recruiting part of it. He took that he took that scholarship job on as a job. I mean, he attacked recruiting like he. And he can't, comes down when he doesn't have to. Things like that. He did come down. When He's he got an extremely to. high IQ too. You know, at the elite one of the 11, highest at the elite eleven. He had one of the. They do a special IQ test for quarterbacks there, and he scored as high as anybody. Right. Yeah. So he they are the, young. They are young guys, but they comport themselves differently. So that helps. He doesn't have the arm that Dylan Raiola has, but very few in the country or the world do. I mean, he's got you know, one of the strongest arms we've seen. Mm -hmm. you know, I've talked to somebody over at Nebraska, and they said as far as getting out of a guy's hand, like, Ryle is as good as you'll see, mm -hmm. and he that, that he's ever seen. And and I I agree with that. I mean. Well, you saw him you saw him up close, very up close in Honolulu during those Polynesian Bowl practices. Yeah. I mean, you don't worry about arm strength. You don't, it's not really, you don't worry about too much at all. It comes down to how well he reads what is protections how, yeah protection and how's the how's his decision making because he's got he's got all those other elements but man i'm gonna tell you sean the decision making reading defenses part isn't easy that's not easy it defenses are more complex than they've ever been they're not they don't tackle the best you know it's not that that's not what that's not what defenses do best anymore but they know where to be they're going they're going for the ball and they know where the ball's going a lot of the time. So you have to be very smart. The pre-snap reading. One thing, too, we don't know about quarterbacks is, will they have the, the, the technology in their helmet now? To Sounds look, like it's going that way. Like for next season. Yeah. To avoid this looking back and forth game. Right. 
Right. Now, yeah, pre-snap is important. I think post-snap is what def- is going to define a lot of guys. Well, in the Michigan sign stealing thing, if anything, hopefully that expediates this helmet technology so we can just eliminate the discussion of sign stealing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what's going to happen. But anyway, yeah, the quarterback discussion is important. The receiver discussion is important. I think Nebraska did pretty good just generally speaking with the class. I mean, the secondary has like 10 bodies has 10, as we mentioned. I mean, they signed a basketball team in the secondary. I mean, yeah. they, that's a lot of guys. I mean, you think about it. They do. 10. Yeah. They play a lot of guys. They did this year. Um, and some of those guys may, may end up on the offensive side too. So yeah, it's interesting the way they, the way they operate. But Matt rule said yesterday, he does not get into identifying numbers that way. He's just taking best players and then let it sort itself out. Yeah. All right. Thank you for joining us here on Husker Online Headlines. Um, this headline and segment of Husker Online Headlines brought to you by Omaha Steaks. Score some big points at your game day get together and kick it off with some mouthwatering starters and more from Omaha Steaks. Check out their appetizer favorites from the Red Hook Ale Beer Battered Shrimp Mini Lobster Grilled Cheese, the Artisan Flatbread. It's the ultimate way to elevate your football gathering or any party. If you go to omahasteaks.com slash Huskers, you can score two packages of chicken wings Mm. and a package of meatballs for free on select packages. Don't drop the ball. Make it a game day to remember with a star studded collection from Omaha Steaks. With Omaha Steaks, you can easily tackle the football party menu as the possibilities are endless. Remember, remember, the only way to get this amazing deal is to head over to omahasteaks.com slash huskers. And don't forget to look for those free game day appetizers on select app, uh, packages. But you're going to want to hurry because this deal ends soon. That's omahasteaks.com slash Husker. Did you get that, Steve Sibble? I did. I mean, you're not a real big steak fan, are you, Sean? Come on now. <laughs> I I don't know that I know anybody that's more of a steak fan than you. I mean, I love them too. Don't well, and our, and the president of Omaha Steaks is, is Nate Rempe, a, a proud Husker. I lived with him in college. Yeah, you're you're at worldwide company based the, in the head, the head honcho lives in. He's a husker. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, the, that is a heartfelt heartfelt production you just gave about omaha steaks you love the steaks slash huskers go check it out yes get get those free appetizers and wings for your big game party here by the way go chiefs okay that is lose half the audience okay no i don't think you'd probably lost half but it's probably unnecessary to say (laughs) i'm saying go niners i like that run game they got sean no mccaffrey's fun to watch he's really fun all right, let's take it to headline number two. Matt Rule paints a clear picture mm. of offensive staff assignments as we move forward. And, you know, I, I think anytime you shuffle the deck a little bit and you throw another offensive coordinator title on somebody, naturally you're like, hmm, hmm. How are they going to do this? Who's calling the plays? Yeah. What's this all look like? Matt Rule, and you really like this on, on Wednesday, mm-hmm. didn't beat around the bush. No, he's very definitive, isn't he? I mean, he on most every matter, he provides a lot of clarity. And he quickly said, I mean, I just said, so because of the change, you know, you bring in Glenn Thomas and put a co-offensive coordinator tag on him. Is there, who's calling the plays? And he, he didn't, I don't know, what did he, sna- he snapped a little bit, a, li- a little bit, and said, I've always said, I've always told you guys, that Satterfield. He's got Sats back. He has Sats back. That's a good way to put it. He really did at a high level. He said Sat is the play caller. Sat. He calls him Sat. Sat will stand in front of the the offense in the offensive room. It's Sat's room. He's in charge of the offense. He'll call the plays. He said that Glenn Thomas will have a collaborative role, if you will, um, and he'll be involved in design as will Garrett McGuire. And that that Matt Rule himself will will pipe in when necessary, but it is Sat's room. It's Sat's room. My question is, like a year ago, this is kind of what he wanted, and yeah. you know we know of at least one guy that was in the mix for that job. Mm-hmm. What job? The quarterback. Yeah, job. quarterback. What coach would? Jump. Yeah. Would somebody else a year ago gotten that co offensive title? 
or was that how Matt Rule had to sweeten the pot to get the salary number to get Glenn Thomas to leave Pittsburgh to come to Nebraska? And by the way, we still don't have the official contract figures for Glenn Thomas. Okay. Yeah, I don't know the answer to your question. I just know that that conversation can get trickier than people probably think about. There's some coordinators out there that want – there's some guys out there that – let's say there's a quarterback's coach in the NFL, for instance. If he was going to – if some guys are going to come to Nebraska or anywhere in a role, in a different role, they might tell the head coach, Sean, all right, I'll, I'll, I'm coming, but it's my offense then. I, I want I want it to be my offense, and I don't even want you involved. There's guys that are like that. They'll tell the head coach, if I'm going to do this, it's my show. It's nobody else's show. I don't even want you involved in it. So it's it, you got to find the right. And they match. tried to do that with Scott Frost. I mean, I, I do believe, you know, his boss Trev Alberts expressed that he wants the head football coach to be a head football coach and to have somebody else run the offense. And that's when they brought Mark Whipple. And we know that wasn't really a great, a it doesn't great, always work. No, it didn't work always, out very well. It doesn't always work out, but anyway, no. They, so they bring in Glenn Thomas and he will. The other part of the conversation is sometimes when you have an offensive coordinator who's who doubles as a quarterback's coach, I'll tell you, Heinrich Harburg mentioned this in an interview in Kearney that, he said the quarterbacks with Satterfield always knew what they're supposed to do on a given Saturday. They understood the offense. They understood the game plan. He said that's never going to be a problem when the offensive coordinator is also the quarterback's coach. But what Heinrich said, and he didn't say that it set him back. He just said it was different that we didn't work on mechanics, technique, footwork, those sorts of things as much as the quarterbacks did when Mario Vardusco was just the quarterback's coach. So, so as you'd expect, an offensive coordinator who also coaches quarterbacks, that offensive coordinator's that his focus can shift a little bit away from those small details. And now, now, as Rule said, with a you know, with a quarterback's coach. They'll get all that attention from the coach. And Josh Martin, who coached tight ends a year ago, remains on the staff in the analyst role. And I'm just pulling back my notes from August when Bob Wager was fired. Uh, Bob Wager was making three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars at that time to coach tight ends. To coach tight ends, Martin kept his analyst role, which it's important to to, to understand how this works. He was an at will employee, meaning you can be fired at any time. There's no contract. Okay. Um, and so he was making a hundred. His pay increased to a hundred and fifty thousand dollars to be the tight ends coach last year. Okay. Um, so nothing about that promotion ever screamed permanent to me. It was always no. kind of a mm-hmm. let's see how it goes. But this is a situation that we're in. It's literally the first week of August, and we don't have a tight ends coach. Right. Um, and so, so he'll remain in in an analyst role and work in there with um, Marcus Satterfield. Yeah, Satterfield will now coach tight ends. So, yeah, Satterfield coaching the tight ends, Rule likes that because the tight ends in Rule's mind, it's a pretty complex position. And in a place like Nebraska, the way Nebraska's run its offense, it is pretty complex because they have to – sometimes they're inline blocking, they're route runners. um, They have to be precise in all those areas. So it makes that – he likes the idea of an offensive coordinator coaching the tight ends. So this is like you kind of alluded to, this is the setup. It's more in line with the setup that rule originally wanted here. And um, spring ball, by the way, March 24th start date, which is a Sunday because that's Holy week. Um, and then they'll Easter's early this year, March 31st Easter. Okay. Um, and they'll have Tuesday, Thursday, take the Easter weekend off, but a uh, quick update on the red, white spring game. Okay. Um, as a Thursday morning, 39,000, 200 tickets had already been sold um, and kind of put some context on that. On that same day a year ago, I went back and read my notes from a year ago. They were at 36,000. So they are tracking a pace that is probably about 10% higher than a year ago. Yeah, it it was pretty high a year ago with a first-year coach. Um, Yeah, they drew – so last year's red-white spring game drew 66,000. Um, 66,045. I had to lead the nation, right? Second to Ohio State. Okay. Ohio State was number one. In 2022, Nebraska drew 54,357. 
the 2021 COVID year, they could only do 50% attendance. They did 36,406. That was the year they had to comfortably space everybody out. <laughs> that was beautiful. So, <laughs> so the, the, yeah, it'll be a big crowd. I mean, it, yeah. And you know, it, it's kind of ticked itself back up. So if you remember Frost's first two years, they do, they, they sold it out 86,000, 818, 85, 946. Then COVID kind of derailed it for two years. I think it's safe to say they're going to get over 70. It's can they get can they push 80? Oh boy. I'll tell you what, what helps now correct me if I'm wrong. I I put spring games out of my mind pretty fast because they're just because of the nature of them. But they played football last year, right? They did and they played football. I like the, the later game. date. Like I like April 27th. I think you got a better chance to have it be a nice, I mean, never say never with Nebraska weather. It could snow on April 27th, but you know, there's don't talk like that. Sean. <laughs> My God. Um, I'm still your back is still recovering from all that. Yeah. From the, yeah. And I'm still recovering from minus 23, but they played football because I know they played football because they turned it over about 10 times. <laughs> um, so the, which I guess was a preview of sorts, but they, I do like, I love the fact that they play football. Right. Um, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Because there's they a tackle lot of, a lot of schools have gone away from it. Tag off. They're, or they're just not doing anything. You they, know? But since 04, um, when you take out the canceled weather gear and the COVID year, the Nebraska Red White Spring game has averaged 67,748. That's pretty good. And one of those years was 50% capacity. So really the game has probably averaged over 70,000 since 04. I would think people would be very interested to see the quarterbacks, particularly, you know, one of them. One in particular, right? Right. Well, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, 23 newcomers. About. Yeah, 23 newcomers. But, I mean, you want to see that new QB out there. All right. Let's take it to headline number three. Northwestern gives Nebraska another disappointing Big Ten road loss. The Big Red are 0-4 okay. in Big Ten road games. Their only true road win of the season is at Kansas State, which is a quality win. I mean, KU just got beat in Manhattan on Monday night. But still. Is the committee going to look at this no Big Ten road win? I mean, let's say Nebraska goes 10 and 10 with no road wins in the Big Ten, which is very doable or plausible. Are they going to be dinged for not winning a Big Ten road game? What do you think? Of course they would, but that's not going to happen. Is he going to keep that's not going to so happen? They're going to get a road win, is what or you're two. saying. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't say, I will say this. I don't say that today with as much confidence as I would have going into the Northwestern game. They only have two road games left. Ohio State and Indiana. Right. They'll win one of those or two of those. Both of them, maybe. Well, in Ohio State, their season might be in a really bad place. They're playing Ohio State February 29th, and they, they're probably going to be completely out of it at that point. Yeah. yeah. Now, okay, you want to get into this discussion. Why do I think they're going to win a road game? Because those teams, Indiana, they're better than Indiana. They're better than Ohio State, number one. Number two, I, I the reason I was so disappointed with last night is because I thought Nebraska really got it going against Wisconsin and Illinois. Illinois was a loss. But they I, I was really impressed in that loss, that how they matched Illinois' intensity. Illinois' defensive pressure didn't bother Nebraska much. Case had 31 points against the probably Terrence Shannon, who's maybe the best defender in the league. Um, so I thought I expected so much more at Northwestern. What we got, what I would care is I would characterize last night as a colossal waste of time. I mean, you watched the game, it was pretty clear within in the first 10 minutes. They had 25 points in the first 10 minutes. Yeah, Nebraska wasn't going to – Northwestern did, yeah. So he was pretty clear Nebraska wasn't going to win. You, they stayed in it like they tend to do, got it to 11 at one point. But you knew what was going to happen, but they drug you till 10 o'clock at night. It went past 10. Yeah, so <laughs> disappointing. <laughs> disappointing. Why is it disappointing? Here's why. Because they got out-rebounded for the 10th time in 11 games, Okay. Nebraska was out rebounded for the tenth time in eleven games. Nebraska committed seventeen turnovers. They committed eighteen against Northwestern in that game we listened to in January, and I thought maybe they would improve in that area. They went away from Jamarcus Lawrence. They didn't start Jamarcus Lawrence at point guard. They went bigger. They went bigger. Um, so they got those issues point guard. 
and they give up too many offensive rebounds, and that's just who they are. So that how, are they going to be able to overcome that? They have, but it's always at home. They you to, know what's going to happen, Sean. They're going to come back on Saturday night at 5.30 against Michigan and look like a top-10 team and throw you into confusion. Now, the good news is those those road games, they're going to – I just think they're better than those teams. Well, and you think about they have, what, how many games left? Six? I'll count them up, Sean. Well, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, four at home, two on the road. So a four and two Big Ten finish. If that's ten. Gonna, I don't think they're going to lose two on the road. So you think if they go five, five and one, I think four and two though, they're still in tournament. Okay. I, I wonder what people will think. I'll, I'll be interested to read the comments. I don't know if you can get into the tournament with no road wins. They won at Kansas state I, What with, in the big 10 is what I'm talking about. With no ro- road wins in the big 10, the committee, especially if you would lose decisively to either Indiana or Ohio state. And you can look back at so many, like the, the game against, Illinois, obviously, they could have easily won that, but oh god, yes, that that early Minnesota one still stings. I mean, it, it, do, it does, except Minnesota's six and five in the league. Sean um, Rutgers, we were watching that game in Hawaii. Stings. That one stings when you go back and look. Iowa at it. stings. Like Maryland stings. Clean their lunch. Yeah, I mean, it was took their lunch money. That that was a <laughs> clean their lunch. Clean their clock. Clean their clock. Took their lunch money. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you Iowa. Mixed, Iowa. Mixed your metaphor, Sean. They, I, they played in an empty arena. I mean, Robin Washett was stranded in Iowa City for three days because you couldn't get, and they couldn't figure out a way to win in that empty arena. I'm just glad he came back. That 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 trip made it done me in. But I, I'll tell you what. That, but Illinois was a different story. They played well against Illinois, and that's why I thought, okay, they found a little something. But last night they were a step slow, probably a little tired from two straight OT games. A lot of people pointed out to me on Twitter that Northwestern was also coming off two overtime games. But the difference is Northwestern. They're at home. Yeah, they're at home. I mean, it helps. You get that energy. Nebraska didn't have it. They didn't have enough energy. And you play Sunday night on the road. You come home. Yeah. There was a part of me that's like, does it, did it make sense to stay out there? But not really. Because those those flights are like an hour. Yeah. I mean. No, I understand why you raised that, though. I mean, I But know. classes. Tough... You, got, you got to go to class. Class. Um, the... <laughs> no, you do. But how, when's the last time you've heard of a student athlete anywhere being suspended from a game for academics? Does that happen anymore? You got to be eligible. Like, I mean, remember the bowl game in San Francisco, Nathan Gary. Was that San Francisco or that was Tennessee? That was, or Tennessee, that was the Music yeah, City Bowl. He couldn't play in that game. That's the last thing. That's the last time I can remember that. And that was pure academics. He he blew off a project. This is what happened. And, and. That's the last time, though, and Sean, that was 2016, seven years ago. I can't remember an academic casualty since then. Well, because the academic staff is so good. I mean, they're usually on top of it all. Yeah, you almost have to check out not to not to be eligible. All right, let's uh, move things forward. Headline number four, and this is an interesting one for our show here because we've never really delved too hard into this topic, Steve Zippel, but – when is the last time you were this interested in tracking Nebraska softball in February? We'll get to see the Jordy ball experience, or as you would say, the Jordine ball experience. Um, that's Sipple's way of saying Jordy ball's first name. If you haven't tuned into our program, but the Huskers play a big series this weekend in Mexico. Yeah. Big, um, big tournament. And Sipple pitched to go to Mexico. Even, but I did not pitch. I, it's Porto Vallarta. Is that what yeah. it's called? That's where they're playing. It would be fabulous. So they play number seven Washington tonight, which is we're taping this Thursday. So the big game against Washington, which has a pitcher from Omaha West Side, by the way, uh, Ruby Malin. As you would say, interesting. Yeah, Ruby Malin was an Omaha West Side graduate. She'll square off against Jordine Ball. Jordy Ball. Jordy Ball. <laughs> Jordy Ball. I mean, Jordy, Jordy doesn't even know you, and she's going to just come over here. <laughs> correct me. And correct you. Yeah, I think. so everybody, all eyes are on this. And in it. <laughs> oh, oh, come on. I mean, guys like me and you following Nebraska softball this time of year haven't done it for probably a quarter century, maybe, Sean? Well, we've pivoted a beat writer to it. Abby Barmore yeah. has moved her spring focus to softball. Because they've added hundreds of seats at Boland Stadium because of jo- Jordy Ball, who two-time All-American, two-time national champ at Oklahoma I think two-time national champ, one national champ for sure, one-time national champ for sure. And they have a good team around her. It's a veteran team. They brought in 
transfer portal players. It's not just her. They're good. They have everybody back except for first base and left field. Uh, so, yeah, there's now they got to deal with expectation a little bit. And Rhonda's talked about that. They know it. They address it. I, I would take the John Cook approach. John Cook tells his, tells his student athletes at the start of the year, yeah, we're expected to play in the Final Four and play for a national championship. That's just what it is. Rhonda's got to – I'm not saying she has to approach it exactly that way, but there's a lot of expectation on him. Can't run from it. And there, are, I believe there's multiple polls, but they're like 17th, but they are picked to 17th. win. 17th. They're picked to win the Big Ten. And I think the big thing is, you know, can they host a regional? Mm -hmm. Getting a super is really difficult, but can they put themselves in that top 16 – to be a host for a regional, that would be an amazing accomplishment. Um, the game of softball has shifted more to the SEC um, predominantly, and obviously Oklahoma is a, is a powerhouse still. They're number one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the West Coast is always going to be a powerhouse, but can Nebraska put themselves in the middle of that conversation? Well, They're the highest-ranked team in the Big Ten right now. Yeah, well, a lot. I mean, here's the thing about the way soft – I mean, now that Nebraska has this attention – what sometimes comes with that is overreaction to things. So you don't – listen, they're going to go play a tournament. It's going to be tough. They're, they're going to play number seven, Washington. They're going to play number 11, Duke. And they're going to play Long Beach State. They might not win them all. Yeah, but if she doesn't and, give up any runs. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. But what I'm, my point is there will be some overreaction if they don't come out of it perfectly. You know, like, okay, maybe they're not as good as we thought. You know, it's, that's just what goes with all the attention. Now, if they go down there and go undefeated, well, watch out, you know. And, and every – we deal with this in Nebraska baseball every year too. Like, it's overreaction city after like saying. the first weekend. That's what I'm saying. Oh, my God, they didn't they – right. didn't. I mean, like they had a they have a bad weekend in like San Diego. Right. And the, to start the year. Right. It, and people just freak out. Yeah, you know, and, and there it could be a little bit of that this weekend. But yeah, it's a sixty-game type season. I right. mean, but it, I'm excited for Ronda and, and Lori Sipple. Yeah, Nobody. I like that. I I like that their program has this attention. You just got to embrace it. And and I and I want to emphasize, it's not all about Jordy Ball. They have a good team. It's a good team. But she's elevated them. Oh yeah. When I mean, you have the best pitcher in the game, right? Everybody yeah. slots up at one hundred. 100. It's like when you add Steve Sipple to your staff, yeah, we all sense. we all just kind of slot it up. Yeah. Except me. I just get depressed. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. Big so they play Thursday night, Friday, and then Saturday morning. Doubleheader, doubleheader on Friday. Doubleheader on Friday against Duke number eleven, Duke, and Long Beach. And then they they cap it off Saturday morning against Utah Valley. I know you don't like when I ask this question, but do you ever remember a Nebraska sports team playing in Mexico? I don't mind you asking that question, and I, I don't I have to think somebody has, but I don't know. I can't remember it. Well, who would? Okay, we. I, I'm almost positive it's never been baseball, unless yeah. like John Sanders way back in the day or something. I don't think so. I I covered the Sanders teams, um, as a student reporter. I don't remember Mexico. I don't remember anything about Mexico softball. I mean, I don't know. Like, would a swimming team have ever gone down there or anything like that? I, I just it doesn't generally make sense. Tennis, yeah. Th there's golf. sports like that. Golf, yeah, tennis. It's hard to say. I mean, there's always. I mean, there there are some security and safety concerns, and anytime you take athletes overseas, oh, one hundred, yeah. Puerto Vallarta. This is a fun time. I hope that Rhonda and, and Lori and, and that that team can have some fun. I mean, it's, that's a nice place to go. You always hear that legendary Dave Van Horn story when they went to Hawaii in like his first year. He sent some guys back and they got caught drinking and they, they were having, it was one, I heard it was just like one beer. They're at dinner, older players having a beer with their meal. And, sent them back. And he went and said, Hey guys, when you're done, come meet me outside. And then he ran them on the beaches till they couldn't, they couldn't. And then sent them home. Yeah. He sent them home. And that that's the same trip. They found Shane Colmaney on the islands when they were out there. Is that right? Yeah, Dave Van Horn stories are there's some good ones. There's I mean, didn't you ones. ask him about that? Yeah, he and, he, and he, chuck, about he chuckled. It. Yeah, he talked about it though. Yeah, he 100 percent talked about it. Dave Van Horn is easily one of my top three Nebraska coaches of all time. He was he was an amazing coach, and what he did with that program was incredible. He came in like a tornado, just whipped it. The players called him the gangster. He was a tough dude, tough dude. You or the wanna, deuce. He wore number two. Yeah, the deuce. you wouldn't want to play cards with him. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he'll get you. 
He'll get you. He's shrewd. Dave Van Horn is about the shrewdest coach I think I've ever been around. He, he, he again, top three here, no matter what. I mean, he was he, what he did it with that program was incredible. I just wonder how many more years he'll go to Arkansas. I don't know. I don't have any insight on that. I mean, he probably wants to win one. He, like, Dave Van Horn wants to win, baby. I mean, that's what he is. All right, let's close the show with headline number five. The Big Ten and the SEC have formed an unlikely marriage to advance the sport of college football um, competitors, fierce competitors as far as television and, and recruiting and NIL. But the Big Ten and the SEC over the last week have joined together to hold hands to kind of advance college football and possibly even move things away from the NCAA <laughs> as things continue to change on the landscape. And, you know, there's been things that have happened over the last few weeks where the NCAA has gone after some notable Power 5 teams, particularly Tennessee, which I think has kind of led us to where we're at right now. I suppose. I know I, there's different ways to look at this alliance, and a lot of people are doing what you're doing and, and seeing it as like a, like kind of like a takeover. Um I don't know how I see it. It's it's so early. Um, Sankey said, and he was on the Fine Bomb show. We're talking about Greg Sankey, who's you know the, the the commissioner of the SEC. He said in the NCAA, we need a healthy governing body. He wants to there to be a healthy governing body, and and he just says, and to the extent that we contribute to that in any way, that explains our focus. I mean. When you when we have these discussions about the Big Ten, Greg Sankey and, and Tony Petiti, the Big Ten commissioner, taking over college football, that sounds good, but it doesn't sound good to the Big Twelve commissioner or the ACC commissioner or any other commissioner. Yeah, but look at the TV payouts. That's why Florida State wants out of there. W once again, though, I don't. And uh, would they create a whole new rule book? Is that what we're talking about? I mean, the way I look at it, the SEC and the Big Ten, their business model of football okay. has advanced beyond what the NCAA is. The business and model, yeah. They don't want to be held to the same exact rules as South Alabama or Troy. No, I yeah. or Arkansas State. Right. They they're not. They shouldn't be. Well, and now here now the, the the what I would say is that list is critical. How about Oregon State? Are they okay? Well, they're out of the Pac-12. How about Boise State? Are they okay? I mean, who's not okay and who is okay? Well, the people that are okay are the teams that are operating with these $80 million, $70 million revenue checks where a Mountain West team might get $15, 20000000 million. Yeah, you're ruling out a lot of guys. Yeah, but it's the separation of resources. Right. So Washington State, out. Separation of resources. Like, okay. They can't, they can't operate at the same level. Right. So these discussions are are interesting, but frustrating because that's only one element. I mean, that's what we're talking about is one element. And what Greg Sankey said is, I hope people don't look to me like I have answers because I don't have magical answers. In fact, Greg Sankey has an old school bent. I bet you if he was sitting here, he would long for 1986 <laughs> um, or 1992. But now they're being challenged in so many ways. In fact, the NCAA has more lawsuits against it than Trump, I think. I mean, there, there are so many people going after the NCAA, I, you lose count. Um, so, yeah, there's all kinds of issues. We're a little different, and I don't look at Sankey and Petiti and say they got the answers. I don't know who has the answers, and I don't know how it's going to look. I don't think they do either. Well, I think one of the things they want to do is – advance the model where the collectives have a place, but the schools can pay, pay the players. Like the revenue model with the television has gotten so much that it's hard for the schools to just keep, I mean, how much more staff and facilities do they need? Mm -hmm. Eventually the increases of these television deals, the, they want to give this to the players okay. and the schools want to be able to pay the players with some of that money and create an endowment or a fund that allows them to give money to the players. But there's that Title IX element to it. So that's why you wonder, will football just break out of the NCAA? Then then they're not even going to be held under yeah. the Title IX standards because that's always the elephant in the room. Um, Title IX, you know, 
if, if you start if the schools start paying the players directly, then all of a sudden the Title IX element has to be involved. But okay. what happens if they break away from the model of the NCAA with college football? Because college football's their championship is not governed by the NCAA. It's governed by the college football playoff committee. And they don't even know into the future. Okay, they know it's going to be a 12-team playoff through 2025. Beyond 2025, we don't even know what the playoff is going to be. Um, when you know, like the SEC and the Big Ten are, are they want a bigger share? So currently, like there's five shares. They're 20 percent shares. The SEC, the Big Ten, the ACC, the Big Twelve each get 20 percent. The group of five splits one share of 20 percent. Okay. I think the SEC and the Big Ten are saying, "Hey, we're going to have." You know, the metrics say we're, we're going to have at least six of the 12 every year, maybe seven of the 12. Mm -hmm. Like we feel like we deserve more than a 20 percent piece of the pie. So there's that. There always there's always money fights, squabbles um, that's going on. Now, we always do this thing where we blame the NCAA. I always find myself in, in this weird position of sort of defending the NCAA to a certain extent. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Multiple states have filed a lawsuit against the NCAA. That's one of the lawsuits against the NCAA, multiple states challenging the NCAA's limits on athletes transferring multiple time, multiple times. I'm for the NCAA in that, in that matter. I don't think there should just be a at student athletes should be able to transfer freely every year. NCAA doesn't think that either. What I'm suggesting, and I suggested on a show recently is it's the states are culpable too they've helped screw this up and they've they've created a lot of the issues that that are there right now with nil with the transfer model so it's not now the ncaa as you've you've pointed out correctly drug drag their feet drag drag yeah, the ncaa feet. could have got in front of this before the supreme court before the state legislative rulings and put their own nil bylaws in place they gambled and said no this will never fly it flew and all of a sudden, they had to go by what the gov the U.S. government essentially put well, down. State, well, the and states, state governments, yeah, state governments, and there's the laws are they're not all the same. It's so it's, there's a lot of confusion, is what we're talking about. So back to this alliance between the Big Ten and SEC. I don't know what it means. I don't know that it means that much. I, I think it means more to you than it means to me. I don't. What 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 can they do? It's like two strong countries just allying together that may not like each other, but they they want to be allies in a war. Okay. Because together they're unstoppable. Right. They're unstoppable. If the SEC and the Big Ten collaborate and want to take on anybody, they'll win. Color me skeptical on the whole thing. But getting them all to agree with one another, that's a whole other right. conversation. I mean, right. I mean, the Big Ten thought that people weren't going to play football in 2020. Mm -hmm. And look how we're all so smart in the Big Ten. And look what the, how, look at the look SEC, how that turned out. Look at the SEC's approach versus the the Big Ten's approach. Diametrically different. So I don't know. I, I mean, don't the Big Ten didn't even allow people at the game. I mean, just like some of the, the thoughts of like back then, just the thoughts of this conference versus the SEC. Like they don't agree on a lot of things. I, you know, the reason why we don't probably enter into these discussions all that often is because they end up going nowhere. There's no, they, they just don't, they don't really, there's a lot of confusion. It's notable though. What we're talking about. Absolutely. It's it's in, in college, college athletics is at a crossroads. It has been for a few years. I just don't know how it's going to shake out. The only thing I can tell you of, that's meaningful at all is what's lacking is leadership. We don't even know really who the leaders are. I guess we're identifying Tony yeah, it's Fox and ABC and ESPN. Yeah. Those are the leaders. We don't know those. Those are nameless, faceless people that we have no idea who those people are. Right? There's people we don't really know who they are. It's NBC, CBS, Fox, and ESPN, and ABC. There's executives. I'd like to know who those executives. The are. money that they're paying is what's leading the game of college football. Yeah, that's what. That's the leader. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll playing, see. telling you to play Friday night football. I mean, money. Get you to play on Friday night, not choice. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I never know how to what to say. I there's just anecdotal bits that kind of concern me. Like Ethan Piper telling me the other day, there are still a lot of guys on the team that play for Nebraska, and, and that Nebraska is important to them. But he goes, but we all know, and this is Ethan Piper. I'm paraphrasing him. 
Ethan Piper, the former Nebraska starting left guard, saying, and you know the guys that, that are playing for the, for the right reasons, but now you know there's a lot of people that are playing for another reason, and I don't have to say it. And he, and he was talking about money. So that's and, the kind of things that people don't want to hear, but it's sort of in front of you now. And the unfortunate thing is the amount of money, it's significant for some players, but it's not enough to change your life in most cases. No. Like Dylan Raiola will probably have life changing. Life changing. Money, but he very life changing. There's very few, you know, like even if it was a hundred grand a year, that's not gonna change your life. No. But it's no, and I know I hope people don't hear this and say I'm somehow against paying student athletes. I'm not. But the model is the model's really not very good. I mean, it's not a very good model. All right. Well, uh, make sure uh, we'll have a full weekend of coverage here on Husker Online. Obviously, Husker softball. Um, Steve Sipple's column on Sunday. If you haven't checked this out, check out HuskerOnline.com. We got a great special. Two months of access for $1. Simply use promo code NU1. That's promo code NU1. Two months for $1 at Husker Online. For Steve Sipple, I'm Sean Callahan signing off for another edition of Husker Online Headlines.